So for our message today, we're going to be talking about, as the title says, Jesus the Prophesied King. As we read throughout our Bibles, there are numerous accounts of prophecy describing the coming of the Savior of our world. The King of Kings, God in His human forms, the Messiah, the one and only Lord Jesus Christ. And today, we're going to go through some of the prophecies pointing towards the birth and death of Christ and break down the significance of these prophecies. And then we're going to look at future prophecies about Jesus as well. If you would, please stand for the reading of God's Word. All right then, the Lord Himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear most righteous Heavenly Father, we come to you once again today, Lord, and I pray that you please just hide me behind the cross today, Father. I pray that you just let whatever words that you want to be the ones spoken today, Lord, be the ones that come out of my mouth today, Father. I pray that this message come, reaches out and touches the ears of every person in this house today, Father, and that somebody receives a blessing from it today, Lord. As always, I just want you to know that we love you and we praise you and we thank you for everything you've done. All men bless you, Father. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So as the scripture says, the virgin will conceive a child and she will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. God is with us. This prophecy refers to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ through the Virgin Mary and says that God is with us. When Jesus was born, he was God in the flesh, God in the physical presence of those that were around him. We see this prophecy of Jesus being born of a virgin. So the question is, why was it important that Jesus be born of a virgin? For that, we have to go back to the beginning and look at what the Lord said to Adam in the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. It says, The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. The first law that God ever gave was that no one should eat from the tree of the knowledge of, the, of good and evil, and that if you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Now, we know from reading through what transpired within the garden that what happened to Adam and Eve after they ate of the fruit is that they did not receive a physical death as punishment, but they received spiritual death. Meaning, the day that they ate of that tree, the sin nature of the human race was formed. Whenever they listened to Satan and disobeyed God, Satan's nature entered them and has continuously spread through every human who has been born to this earth, except one, Jesus Christ. And I'm going to explain why. Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15 says this, Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. The Lord speaking to the serpent. The Lord speaking to Satan here refers to there being hostility between his offspring and the woman's offspring. Saying he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. I believe that the offspring coming from the woman is referring to is the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is coming to defeat Satan once and for all. And in reference to Satan striking his heel, I believe it is referencing how Satan will damage Christ through his followers. But one thing that we can take note of is, it is referencing a woman's offspring here. Now if you were to read those same verses from the King James Version, it will use the word seed in place of the word offspring. Which is interesting, because to the best of my knowledge, every time the word seed is mentioned throughout the Bible, 
It is always in reference to a man's seed, not a woman's. So why the distinction here? Because we all know how babies are made. Every person who is alive on this earth had to be born of a father and of a mother. It is physically impossible for a child to come into this earth any other way. So why is this important? Because there was one man who was born without an earthly father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 1 verses 18 through 24 says, This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. We see in this passage talking about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ that it was prophecy fulfilled. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, who was impregnated by the power of the Holy Spirit, the only man to ever walk the earth to not come from the seed of man. So why is it so important that he was born of a virgin? Because we all have genetic traits that are passed down from our parents. So what would that mean? That would mean that our sin nature would be a trait that is passed down from generation to generation. So the question would be, which parent would be the carrier of that trait? It would be the father. And since Jesus did not have a physical father, he did not inherit the trait of the sin nature, instead, because his mother was impregnated by God through the Holy Spirit, he instead inherited God's trait. He did not receive a sin nature, but received God's divine nature. The scripture even goes on to say that Joseph did not have relations with Mary until after Jesus was born. Now, if she was already pregnant and Joseph had already married her, why did he choose to wait? because I believe he did not want to contaminate what God had put in place with his sin nature until it had reached completion. The birth of the Lord Jesus Christ is one of the greatest events that has ever taken place. If God had not seen it fit to send his Son into the world, we would have no chance at salvation. Beginning to end, everything in our Bibles points to Jesus, and his birth was only the beginning. God sent him to this earth with a mission to save mankind, and He gave us the opportunity to choose to accept Him as Lord and Savior whenever He died on the cross and rose again. Jesus' death was prophesied in Psalm chapter 40, verses 6-8. through eight. It says, You take no delight in sacrifices or offerings. Now that you've made me listen, I finally understand you don't require burnt offerings or sin offerings. Then I said, Look, I have come as is written about me in the Scriptures. I take joy in doing your will, my God, for your instructions are written on my heart. This prophecy was given approximately around 970 B.C., and the death and resurrection of Jesus took place around 30-33 A.D. That is around a thousand year difference in the time the prophecy was given and Jesus' death. Burial and resurrection took place. How do we know this is prophecy in regards to what Jesus done on the cross? Because we can see reference being made to it when we look at our next piece of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 5 through 10 says, That is why when Christ came into the world, He said to God, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You are not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, Look, I have come to do your will. 
O God, as it is written about me in the Scriptures. First, Christ said, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, though they are required by the law of Moses. Then he said, Look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection were prophesied events that had to take place in order for us to have a chance to be born again. The scripture here directly states that by doing this, Jesus canceled the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time, proving that we cannot be made holy by our works, but only through accepting the gift of grace that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have only touched on just a few of the prophecies about Jesus that have came true. And the thing is, is that there is more prophecy about Jesus that we can look forward to being fulfilled. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18 says, We'll tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet Him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth, will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Jesus Christ, our Savior, is going to come down from heaven with the commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. Think about that for a moment. Think about how beautifully amazing that is going to be. Think about how exciting it is going to be for us who know that He is coming to hear that. I can't wait. First, the dead in Christ will rise from their graves. Then together with them, those of us who are alive and remain, will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. Think about that for a second. All of our loved ones who died before us that accepted the gift of grace that comes from Jesus Christ will meet Him in the air at the same time as us, being reunited with our dead loved ones and being united with our Savior at the same time, can you imagine how much joy we will feel? The amount of joy is far more than anything that we can comprehend. It is indescribable. The Scripture says we will be forever with the Lord. Forever with the Lord. Never having to worry about anything ever again. Eternal joy and eternal peace. That is prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ that is coming true. And it is coming true very soon. Now I'm going to share one more prophecy that has yet to take place about the Lord Jesus Christ. His second coming. Now the rapture and second coming of Christ are two separate events. We just looked at the rapture of the church. Now we're going to look at His second coming. Revelation 19 verses 11 through 16. It says, Then I saw a heaven opened, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses from his mouth, came a sharp sword to strike, to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of all kings and Lord of all lords. This great event where the Lord Jesus Christ will come to vanquish Satan's armies, and I believe that we will be with him at this time, is going to be one of the greatest events to ever take place that will lead into the millennial kingdom. And after the millennial reign is over and he casts Satan into the lake of fire, 
we will be in eternity with our Lord. So from the first prophecies that have taken place to the prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled, we see Jesus grow from a small child to the ultimate sacrifice to cover all sin and finally to the warrior king that he has always been meant to be. That is my Savior. And in a world where it has become so easy for us to not follow him, everything that has came true about him and everything that will come true about him, now is the time to decide, are we going to follow him or not? With that, let's get a song of invitation. Today we have heard the word. We have heard the many different prophecies about Jesus Christ in our Bible. We have heard about everything that has came true about him and everything that is going to come true about him. So the question today is, if there is anybody in here that does not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we have the proof. It is written in His Word. So if you do not know Him, I ask you to please come to this altar and we'll have a talk and we will work that out. Because our time is running out, folks. Now's the time to gather all the wheat because He's coming back.